The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Not just friends, but partners. That was the sentiment at this week's North American Leaders Summit. Tonight, what Canada wanted and what it achieved. Then, we will get perspective on the ground in Brazil after protesters stormed government buildings there last weekend. Also, we will hear from our Ontario hubs about a dog rescue that's helping fly in communities and their canines. And from who the economy works for to ending the war in Ukraine, we've got the Agenda's Week in Review. It's Friday, January 13th, and that's all ahead on the Agenda. Canada, Mexico and the United States form one of the world's largest free trade zones with 500 million people and a combined gross domestic product of more than 25 trillion US dollars. So when the leaders of those countries gather as they did for the North American Leader Summit this week, it matters. Louise Blay served as Canada's ambassador to the UN and was formally posted in the US as a Consul General for Canada. She is now Special Advisor to the Business Council of Canada and was at this week's summit and joins us now from Sarasota, Florida for some perspective on what was accomplished. Welcome to the program. Happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. As we mentioned, very busy week for you. And I want to take a step back before we look at sort of the accomplishments and, and what was sort of discussed. What were some of the political crises or global events that sort of shaped and influenced the topics uh, that were discussed at this year's summit? Well, the past year has been uh, enormously uh, uh, disruptive, obviously, for for uh, for the North America and our, our supply chain in particular, the war in Ukraine, the invasion of Russia in Ukraine, as well as, you know, just as we were just coming out of the pandemic, uh, that was a second shock that just it has uh, broadside. So going into the summit, I think the leaders were really very much thinking about economic security. All right, let's talk about, uh, from the Canadian perspective, what were Trudeau's main objectives going into this summit? Because there was a lot of conversation that, hey, this was really going to be a, a summit about Mexico. Uh, the Americans had a lot of stuff that they wanted to cover, and potentially Canada's sort of agenda was going to be overshadowed. Actually, uh, while I was personally worried about that going into the summit, I was very pleased to see that a lot of work had gone on in advance of the summit. Uh, diplomats from all three countries worked very, very hard in ironing out issues and putting forward a framework for a more North American uh, approach to, uh, to our economic challenges. So actually, I think it was a very successful summit for, for, uh, for Canada. The other aspect that was really brand new this time is that for the very, very first time, there was a business component to the summit. So the day before the trilateral, we had a delegations from all three countries meeting with each other uh, to come up with solutions to shared challenges, but also having access to the leaders to share uh, with them our concerns from the business community, but also what we think would be paths to, uh, to consider moving forward. All right, we'll definitely get to some of those business uh, conversations as well. I want to talk about some wins. There was a few things that had floated around in terms of biggest achievements for Canada. What would you say are the biggest achievements for Canada that came out of the talk so far? You know, sometimes people say these summits are are, are not very helpful, or, <laughs> or there's just uh, it's just pro forma. That's actually quite not true because leading to the summit, leading uh, uh, leading on to the summit, what we saw is a willingness on the part of the Americans to uh, help solve some of our outstanding issues. And here I'm referring to Nexus. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's an accident that uh, that we were able to announce a workaround uh, uh, to the Nexus uh, impasse. And I think that's uh, enormously positive. I think we heard that um, that the Americans were asking Canada to lean in even further in Haiti. Look. This is a positive thing. No matter, it does not matter in the end what Canada does decide to do. The fact that the United States is looking to Canada to help it solve problems, I think, is a very positive development. So I do think that Prime Minister Trudeau carved uh, quite a bit of profile for himself, and this was uh, no easy feat, uh, given that leading 
the week before the summit, we had the arrest of the cartel issues and the Americans very, very much concerned with the border, the president going to the border on his way to the summit. At the end of the day, once they were the three of them together, they really spoke trilaterally and they projected themselves into the future. So that was very good to see for Canada. I want to follow up actually on Nexus in Haiti. I want to start with uh, the first. Um, why? You know, there, there was this backlog back in October of over 300,000 uh, applications. Uh, they have since come down. I think they've, uh, they've cut that down by 100,000 or so. There's some progress on there. But why was this break, uh, breakthrough rather significant for Canada uh, in that, regarding Nexus? But with the Nexus program, really, Canada is by far the biggest user. It really makes a huge difference for our business leaders uh, to be able to move more easily through, through the border. Time is money. So we have focused for a very, very long time on making the border more efficient for goods. But at the same time, now a lot of the world's economy is based on services. So you really do have a lot of back and forth on the border. And then being able to clear um, more efficiently uh, our busy airports, I think it was a priority for Canada. And we had a, an enormous backlog. Uh, the Americans coming out of the pandemic were doubling down on their requirement that their border agents be protected, have immunities in, in, the, in the, uh, while they were uh, screening Canadians. So mm -hmm. I think that, uh, and they, they did try to leverage our desire to get this uh, solved so that they could get that, that um, that immunity uh, protection. In the end, I think the workaround that was suggested by, I believe it was Scotty Greenwood of, of uh, the CABC that came up with this idea, that um, that they Canadians be first pre-screened by Canadian border officials on our side of the border, and on their first trip into the U.S., they would get their second interview uh, to get the nexus pass. So I think it's great to get this out of the way. It's a practical workaround. And um, I think we should we should be very grateful that that has been resolved. As you mentioned, overwhelming uh, Canadians use Nexus. It's about 80% of the 1.7 million people who use it. Correct. So yes, indeed a big number. Uh, let's talk about Haiti, of course. Uh, Biden's been pressuring, uh, pressuring Trudeau to sort of set up a Canadian-led international security force in Haiti. You talked about it a little bit, but I think one of the questions, particularly for Canadians and Ontarians, is what is it in, what is it, uh, what's in it for Canada, rather, uh, politically speaking? Obviously, a humanitarian crisis there, but what what is it seen for as Canada on the global stage to be partaking in sort of this mission here? Well, the fact is, is that Canada has been leading on Haiti from uh, since oh, for many, many years, but particularly so since the earthquake. Uh, we have been leaders and and providing uh, uh, you know, humanitarian support. And we also have led at the UN. It was Canada that um, that has been for a very long time the, the chair of the task force, the UN task force. And we have advocated extremely strongly for the maintenance of the UN mission in, um, in Haiti. That did not come to pass in the end. The UN pulled out and that was actually uh, something that Canada very much regretted. But I think moving forward, as the U.S. asks us to lean even more into the, the uh, Haiti, I think that we will have to consider whether whatever action is are decided will actually have a chance of working. Um, that's it's a very complex theater. It has, um, and we don't want to give up on Haiti by any stretch of the imagination, and the government is very concerned about it. But at the same time, we really have to make sure that whatever we uh, Canada decides to do on behalf of, of a coalition, that, uh, that it has really a recipe for success. And I think that's what our government is considering at the moment. Very good. I promised we would talk business, so let's do that. Leaders from business groups in all three countries, including the Business Council for Canada, had penned an open letter calling on the three amigos to enhance North American competitiveness. Let's read a quote from that letter. It reads, Today we have an unprecedented opportunity to position North America as the world's leading producer of electric vehicles, also known as EVs, but we will only succeed if we work together to overcome shortages of key raw materials, encourage investment in new manufacturing capacity and make it easier for consumers to purchase EVs. Now, I was, you know, reading a lot about this and there was one quote that stuck out in terms of 
when we look at all three of uh, the nations involved here, U.S., they have the capital. When we look at Mexico, they have uh, the resource. And when we talk about labor, when we talk about on the Canadian front, we have say, the natural resources. The Ontario government has heralded EVs as an important uh, pillar for this province's economic future. And here in Canada, we, as we mentioned, have those critical uh, minerals like lithium, cobalt, graphite, and nickel. What do we stand to gain from a trilateral partnership when we talk about uh, EVs here? Well, it's interesting. It's not surprising that automotive has been really at the center of our, of our trade relations with United States and, and, and Mexico. It's at the center of uh, Kuzma. A and so as we transition towards green, you know, we make the tra green transition, EV is at the center of that. So Canada very much, uh, I think, is, is well positioned to ensure that we have a really good share of that pie because I think the uh, United States want to become the premier manufacturer of EV vehicles. And that includes batteries, which is, of course, the integral part of, a, an, of an EV vehicle. And uh, when we succeeded last year, to convince the Americans to carve out, uh, carve in or carve out um, uh, Canada into their uh, the tax credit scheme, that was a huge win that lent, laid the groundwork to enable us not just to provide uh, our critical minerals, but also interest European and Asian car manufacturers to uh, to to open and 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 establish plant manufacturing in Canada. So what you're seeing today is a lot of announcements coming out of Ontario. And and while we focus on the big, big manufacturers, you know, the assembly, um, the assembly plants, there's a huge supply chain that feeds all of that. And there, it's, it's everything from software uh, to, as you said, the, the critical mi minerals. So everyone can gain, you know, whether it's Quebec or other provinces that have capabilities. And a great example of that is Project Arrow, which is the APMA uh, prototype of all Canadian made from beginning from bumper uh, to bumper uh, Canadian EV vehicle. So I think we're proving that we are at the table and not just for raw materials, but actually for the technology and everything else that goes into the car. So um the United States listened to us last year. I think we should be very happy about that. They sometimes tend to uh, to forget us uh, from time to time. So this was a positive development, and and as and this becomes a model for other sectors. I think if we can prove we can get this done with something as important as EV cars, then you know the sky's the limit for the rest. All right, let's talk about another positive here. At least on paper, the three countries agreed to strengthen investment in the semiconductor supply chain, sort of to prevent an over-reliance uh, on Asia. How will, however, there was concerns about this Buy America provision. Um, I, I, I want to get your take, you know, how will Buy America provisions factor into the three countries' cooperation on this file? We have, I think, you know, we're getting to the beginning of this conversation with the Americans. It was great to see at the summit. Uh, you heard it from Secretary Blinken. You heard it from President Biden. This really North America approach to uh, to uh, to that sector, to uh, to the general uh, securing of our supply chain issue. It was very. Uh, enlightening to hear Secretary Raimondo also tell the business community that she feels that their uh, chips, um, so so to so to say, um, act actually is is going to rely as well on Canada and Mexico to provide the components that they need. So the, her message was: Look, yes. These are these are uh, incentives that will that will attract investment in the United States, but that investment will lead to supply chains that will be beneficial to both countries. So that's the message. And so, but we, I think, we, I don't think we can take that for granted as Canada. I think we have to keep pushing. Um, you heard that the uh, you know the French had a message or two to um, President uh, Emmanuel Macron when he was in, in Washington not too long ago, expressed a great deal. Of, of frustration uh, to the Americans with the with these um, with these protectionist policies, and we'll have to wait and see what Europe's able to get out of this. But I think that we have succeeded at um, 
convincing the Americans that first they should look to their own continental partners. And But we'll have to continue to push that. All right. Canada and the U.S., uh, this was another one talking about energy, are sort of in a dispute with uh, Mexican President Obrador about sort of his preferential treatment uh, of Mexico's state oil company and, and national power utility. Is Mexico discriminating Canada and American investors for setting up shop, uh, from setting up shop in, in Mexico? Look, we think, uh, we think they are. Uh, we have uh, requested through USMCA, uh, we've invoked the dispute mechanism on, on the energy issue. It was raised at the summit, and you heard uh, the, the Mexican president reply that, look, uh, send, send me your, your companies, I'm willing to speak with them. He's showing some willingness, I think, to uh, to examine the issue. Um, we'll have to continue to work on on on, on this, and I'm, I'm hoping that we can we can avoid a, a full-on panel. But um, what I can say is there are examples of Canadian companies in the energy sectors being extremely successful uh, in Mexico today, like TC Energy, for example, that just received approval for a major pipeline um, a project. A, uh, it's, a, it's a natural gas uh, pipeline that will actually bring a greener, cheaper energy to uh, more uh, poorer areas of Mexico, so which is uh, near and dear to the heart of the of the president, and he cites that as a success story. So I think we can build on that. We can show that we can be a partner in helping Mexico achieve its own objectives. And it's interesting to note that that pipeline was at, will actually also allow Mexico to export its natural gas in Central uh, America. So um, I think we have to continue to have a dialogue and, and hopefully we can, uh, we can bring in even more Canadian investment in, it and, and in the country and, uh, and have a more of a continental approach to energy security, which is so important. All right, I wanna stick uh, with our sort of relationship with Canada and Mexico. We have a few minutes left. Uh, in your op-ed, you had written for the Globe and Mail that uh, Canada and Mexico have not actually sought close strategic uh, ties yet. Uh, Canada historically has, has sort of resisted trilateralism and has preferred making separate deals with the US. It's, it's sort of hard to ignore uh, the US when they're, you know, A, smack dab in the middle, but also one of the, one of the biggest uh, competitions and competitors there. Why is it important that we sort of break away from this path and and I will say right off the start that I I was I actually I've fallen prey to that vision as well having served in in, uh, in the U.S. It's easy for us as Canadians to really focus exclusively on the United States, and uh, and and we've always seen we tend to see Mexico as a trilateral trade partner with that continental trade but uh, agreement, but at the same time. I think that given the fact that there's only three of us on this continent, the world is getting more and more uncertain. Uh, and I think that we cannot afford to have uncertainty in our own neighborhood. And that means building trust, be building relationships, and learning uh, to work together in a, in a wider framework with the Mexicans. So I think that if we strengthen that pillar, that bilateral relationship with Mexico, uh, we will make our relationship with the United States that much um, more balanced and and more successful. I'm not talking here about ganging up, <laughs> you know, against the Americans. That's never a good strategy. But at the same time, I think the United States has a lot to gain by Canada and Mexico having a close uh, relationship. And so I'm encouraging a closer academic ties, the sorts of that we have with, with Europe, for example, with student exchanges, academic exchanges, um, as well as, as cultural people-to-people -people ties. Look, I was just... Uh, I've just been spending a lot of time in Mexico City, and I'm struck that as Canadians, we tend to think of Mexico, at, you know, beaches and, and palm trees, but there is a vibrancy and there is a sophistication to the Mexican uh, culture that somehow many of us have failed to uh, fully appreciate. And, and while, yes, the security concerns are real, 
um, they are not the end all and be all of uh, of the of Mexico as a country, and um, and I s- certainly think that if if we were to have greater contacts, know each other better, uh, I think we would we would be able to work more closely together. And I'll just close by just saying that uh, one of the manifestation of that is working together in multilateral arenas we 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 don't really uh, at the moment uh, when canada consi- considers a position at the un uh, whether it's in new york or geneva we call our friends in europe and of course the americans but we should also be calling mexico and say hey what do you think about this and then also hearing from them what are you hearing in your you know and in, in, with your uh, allies in central and latin america and how could we work together to achieve uh, certain things uh, so that's what i'm i'm encouraging and uh, and I, I really do believe that this is the given the global context of today this is the way to go for canada Really great stuff, Luis. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. Of course, something that we will continue to follow over the course of the next couple months and years. It was my pleasure. Thank you. When thousands of supporters of the former president of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, stormed the country's Supreme Court, Presidential Palace, and Congress last Sunday, comparisons to the January 6th insurrection in the U.S. came fast and furious. With us now to explain how well those comparisons stand up to scrutiny and what fueled the violence in the first place, we're joined from Rio de Janeiro by Brazil News Director for the Associated Press, David Biller. Welcome, sir. Thanks for having me. All right, so there are a number of factors into sort of what happened, but explain to us, why did the insurrection happen? Well, first of all, we had encampments of these pro-Bolsonaro supporters outside of army buildings in multiple cities, including in capital Brasilia. Uh, These are people who do not accept Jair Bolsonaro's loss and have been asking for the armed forces to intervene, asking for Bolsonaro when he was still in power to take action, and that didn't happen. Uh, Bolsonaro spent months sowing doubt about the reliability, about the electronic uh, voting machines that the country uses and has used since 1996 without any evidence of fraud. He didn't present any fraud uh, claim, uh, evidence as well. And so um, these people were led to believe that this election was fraudulent, even though there was no proof of that. Uh, they, they were waiting for some sort of move from the armed forces, from the president, and that didn't come. So. On Sunday, thousands of them, uh, not just who were there already camped out, but who also arrived on buses, went to protest, and what we saw was complete mayhem. Uh, Part of the reason that this appears to have happened is that the police force, the local police force, was either unprepared or may even have been colluding with these protesters. Investigations have just really started, and they're looking into whether the local security secretary had somehow uh, facilitated uh, the, the protesters' ability to access uh, the, these top government buildings. All right. As we know, last week was the anniversary of the attacks in the U.S. on the U.S. Capitol Hill on January 6th. A lot of parallels, of course, have been made. Uh, let's, let's talk about that. What parallels can be drawn between the insurrection in Brazil and uh, what happened in the U.S.? Well, first of all, like I said, uh, the president spent months claiming that the the voting uh, system that Brazil uses was susceptible to fraud without providing any evidence uh, to that effect. We saw the same thing in the U.S. Um, These are also support, you know, diehard supporters in a very polarized country. Um, I think also like like Trump, Bolsonaro was was straining against other other branches of government, other institutions. And and so obviously that uh, that inflamed the, the tensions of, of, of the country that was already very, very strained. Um, that's part of it. Although the thing is, Bolsonaro left before Lula's inauguration, two days before. This wasn't like Trump in Washington saying, you know, let's march on the Capitol. Uh, it, it, it was Bolsonaro in Florida, actually, and and you know he was posting photos, and his supporters were sort of trying to to assess these photos for enigmatic clues, as though as though Bolsonaro was maybe guiding them from afar. But there was nothing really, you know, saying you know you need to take action. Um, you know, I, I think that another thing that's that's worth highlighting is that there's a lot of overlap between you know, the orbit of of. Uh, Jair Bolsonaro's family 
and and that uh, of of Trump. You saw uh, Eduardo Bolsonaro, his lawmaker son, has really built bridges with Steve Bannon and Jason Miller and and Mike Lindell, these people who were were around Donald Trump. And when when the the rioters were were taking taking over the Capitol, Steve Bannon was sharing video and calling them freedom fighters. So you know these these are two different. Um, two different scenarios, but there is overlap, and, and investigators are, are looking into whether there are, in fact, connections, direct influence. I'm hoping you can give us a sense of what's happening on the grounds there. Um, and, and I preface that with, should Brazilian authorities and our Brazilian authorities bracing themselves for more violent demonstrations? They certainly are bracing themselves for more. Um, the other day, uh, we had, the, we had a, a call for protest it was called a mega protest to retake power that was supposedly going to occur in two dozen cities. Um, we had the Supreme Court Justice Alexandre de Moraes. <clears throat> he he uh, decreed that you know people could not be could not occupy public uh, buildings, could not uh, block roads, and and really ordered uh, authorities from around the country to to hold people responsible to record. You know, license plates and identify people. And in the capital, we saw you know, the, the the man who has been tasked with um, with shoring up security in in the federal district. He he created a designated area for protest and surrounded it by police and national guard. But the result was a complete dud. There were two protesters in Brasilia, literally two. Um, in Rio de Janeiro, there were there were something like ten. And more journalists were covering it than than protesters. We also had, um, you know, Sao Paulo was, was completely empty. And so, it, I think it really shows just how jumpy authorities are right now. They're very concerned that something else could happen, and they're not taking any chances. But what remains to be seen is whether these protesters are regrouping, uh, whether they they will try to stage other. Uh, you know, uprisings, whether in the capital or elsewhere. I don't know if this has to do with it, but, uh, you know, the Brazilian government has been praised sort of for its its swift response and, and, and taking measures like declaring federal emergency, arresting more than a thousand rioters. Um, what's the sentiment on the ground there? Do Brazilians agree that uh, Lula's administration handled the demonstrations well? And maybe that is perhaps the reason why, say, these these later protests are quote-unquote duds. What we've seen in the wake of this uprising is a sort of a rally around uh, democracy led by Lula. He, he and the heads of other institutions, Supreme Court, Congress, and, and governors from, from all of Brazil's states um, are, are trying to show and, and forcefully show that they are on the side of democracy and they won't tolerate attempts to subvert it. So, you know, you, at least, first of all, from the authority, from the authority level, there, there is a clear sign that there will be no tolerance for, for uprisings of this sort. Um, also, the authorities are, are pursuing not just legal action against the people who were detained and arrested physically in these spaces and at the encampment outside uh, the, the Brasilia Army headquarters, but they're also going after the people who finance the transport of the protesters to the city, the people who may have enabled them to storm the buildings, uh, the, the, the local security personnel who may have stood aside and, and let protesters pass. So it's a very forceful response from the, the authorities. And then from, from the average people, I think a lot of, a lot of us here in Brazil um, we had, you know, we, we, we were expecting this because, you know, to some extent, because Bolsonaro had incited his protesters for so long or, or stoked, uh, you know, their, their discontent. Um, and, and then we all sort of let our guard down a little bit after, after Lula was inaugurated. The scene that played out the week afterwards was, was shocking to, to people as a result. You know, we, we were not prepared to see this. And a lot of people who were moderates, um, or, or even some on the right do not feel that this represents them, and, they, and they've rejected this. And you've seen people you know, on the, in, the, in the Bolsonaro camps, in fact, claiming uh, falsely that this, these, this violence was perpetrated by you know, leftist uh, infiltrators of their movement. Um, but, so you see a, a you know, widespread rejection of what, what happened on Sunday. All right, I want to return to Bolsonaro, as you mentioned, in Florida right now. It's 
it's sort of emerging as a potential diplomatic issue uh, between Brazil and the U.S. Has the Brazilian government, to your knowledge, put in any requests to the American government to have him brought back or expelled from the country or returned to Brazil? Um, to my knowledge, no. The Justice Minister said the other day that they don't actually even have the technical ability to ask for extradition because there aren't, uh, you know, there is no criminal charge against against Bolsonaro at this moment, and so doing that is is not uh, something that's within their within their powers. Um, that said, there is an effort, first of all, on the part of of U.S. lawmakers. Uh, Democratic lawmakers sent a letter to Biden. I think it was 46 of them. Um, in, uh, including Joaquin Castro, um, and and I think the letter was led by three or four others, Gregory Meeks, uh, and I can't remember who else, but urging Bol uh, urging Biden to review the visa status of Bolsonaro. It's they have not said uh, the State Department hasn't said what visa he entered with, but right. it's presumed he entered with an A1 visa, which is for sitting presidents, and when you're no longer in power, you have to you know you have to revise your visa status within a month, and so these lawmakers are urging the Biden administration to assess his visa and and in the case that he's on an A1, which people presume to be the case, uh, revoke that and, and force him out of the country. There's one other thing I would mention, which is that the security secretary for the federal district on the day of the riot was actually in Florida as well. He wasn't present. This is a man who was Bolsonaro's justice minister and has been, uh, you know, there, there are allegations that he facilitated this this uh, this riot. He fired several subordinates and promptly left the country, uh, which which the the uh, federal appointee who's in charge of security now for the federal district has said amounts to sabotage. He is still in the U.S. and the justice minister just minutes ago said in a press conference that if he isn't back by by Sunday, he will be considered a fugitive and they will request his extradition. There's already an order for him to be placed under arrest. David, thank you so much. Some really interesting stuff there. A story, of course, we will continue to follow. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Scarce veterinarian services and more dogs and owners to care for them is giving some communities in Ontario's far north a rough time. Enter Paws of the North Rescue in Muskoka. Charnel Anderson covers the Northwest for Ontario Hubs and she joins us now from Thunder Bay to explain. Hello, Charnel. Hey, Jan. All right, so on this program, we often talk about health care in northern Ontario being difficult to access, but pet owners also have challenges getting care for their animals. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, whether you have two legs or four, um, there's some challenges access accessing healthcare in the north. Um, you know, I've personally been on a wait list for a doctor for a couple years, um, and it's it's really all but impossible to get a, a vet in Thunder Bay right now. Um, you know, there's people driving three hours to Dryden to see a vet, um, or they're heading south to the U.S., which is about an hour and a half drive. Um, and, you know, there's been people who, sadly, their pets have died without receiving care because um, of the lack of access to vet care. So this is really an ongoing issue. Um, but the challenges to vet care, uh, you know, aren't solely a Thunder Bay issue. Um, there's many rural and remote communities that don't have vets in the community at all. And so in my article, I was looking at um, a, a First Nations in northeastern Ontario, uh, like Fort Albany and Attawapiskat, where oftentimes they have to fly their pets out to Timmins. Um, and as you can imagine, it's not cheap. You know, it costs hundred, hundreds of dollars to fly a dog out. Uh, and that's not to mention the vet bill. So um, there's definitely gaps in the system, um, or what one vet I spoke to calls veterinary uh, deserts in the province. And um, but thankfully, you know, there's organizations like Dog Rescues who've stepped up to fill this gap. And so they partner with communities to provide vet clinics, typically funded through um, fundraisers. So these services are often offered uh, pro bono. And, you know, they provide services like spaying and neutering and vaccinations, which are important for the health of dogs, you know, as well as population control. All right, let's talk about the issues of sort of stray dogs in northern Ontario. Let's let's make it clear. Is this an issue? Is this sometimes can fall into a sort of some stereotypes and, and maybe this image that dogs are sort of running wild. But is that an issue sort of across north northern Ontario? 
Yeah, so I mean, I wouldn't characterize it as a northern issue necessarily. I think it comes down to issues around population control and, you know, also access to vet care. You know, I don't know if you remember uh, The Price is Right and Bob Barker telling you to get your pet spayed and neutered. Right. Um, but yeah, and I mean, because it's important because, you know, females can have um, one or two litter litters of puppies a year. And if there's a lot of females, it can get out of hand pretty quickly, right? Um, so, for example, in Fort Albany, uh, they're working on a dog control bylaw, which they haven't had up until now, you know, because they're having issues with nuisance dogs and aggressive dogs. And, you know, so when a female goes into heat, the males can get fairly aggressive. And sometimes, you know, they're hanging around in packs and it can be kind of kind of intimidating, right? Um, I spoke with a chief in Fort Albany and she says, you know, it's a small community, but she doesn't want to walk around. She drives because she would prefer to avoid the dogs. Okay. Uh, in your article, you talk about one organization, Paws of the North Rescue. Tell us about what they're doing to help dog owners. Yeah, so Paws of the North uh, Rescue is a dog rescue in Muskoka, and I spoke with their uh, founder and director. Her name is Holly Marco, and she's been working with Northern Dogs, she says, um, for about 10 years in Northern communities. And so Paws of the North primarily works with fly-in communities. Uh, they've shifted their focus in the last year or so to providing supplies and services to these communities. So, you know, things like dog food and leashes and collars, as well as organizing the vet clinics. Um, so next week, Holly and a team of uh, volunteers and vets who are also volunteering, um, they'll be flying up to Attawapiskat in Fort Albany. And initially they wanted to drive, but the ice roads aren't ready yet. Uh, and so, the, it, you know, that's increased the cost of this trip um, you know, fairly significantly. I think Holly estimates it's going to be around $25,000. Um, but, you know, that's going to allow them to spay and neuter as many dogs as they can. They figure some around um, 100 animals in each community, um, as well as providing things like uh, vaccinations. And this is something that the chief of Fort Albany says that she's grateful for, you know, given the challenges uh, with access to vet care in the community. Uh, you talked about a pretty steep price tag there, $25,000 roughly. Just curious, uh, where does that money come from? Uh, it's all, you know, uh, fundraisers and people contributing, right? So. All right. Uh, we can't talk about dogs on this program without, uh, of course, showing some photos. So we do have some photos here. Uh, these are dogs that Holly Marco's team has looked after. Tell us what we're looking at here. Who's in this photo? Obviously, it's a really cute dog in the corner there as well. Yeah. So that's Holly, the director of Paws in the North. And uh, she's in Attawapiskat there. They did a mini wellness clinic last fall. It looks like she's giving him a vaccine. Um, you know, puppies need a whole series of vaccines in order for, uh, to prevent disease some of which can be deadly, right? And so that's one of the services that they provide um, in these communities. All right, let's look at the next photo. Oh, look at these. Okay, <laughs> what are we looking at here? That's just a big old box of puppies. Um, I don't know which community they're from, but they were waiting uh, for their flight out, uh, likely to be fostered and adopted down south. Uh, like a lot of rescues, Paws of the North, you know, will take these quote unquote excess puppies to larger population centers, um, you know, where there's more demand for adoption. All right, speaking of travel, our next photo, we got some dogs here in uh, some some carriers. Some more gorgeous puppies that, you know, the blue eyes there. Um, yeah, so these, they're also being transported. Um, and, you know, Holly says that people kind of have a misconception about northern dogs. You know, mm -hmm. they think maybe they, they have a lot of energy, high exercise needs, you know, maybe they're better outdoors. But she has three of these dogs herself, and, you know, she says they're the best adventure dogs, but they're also happy to just be a couch potato with you. Okay, last photo, a very beautiful moment here. Tell us what we're looking at here. Yeah, I mean, what can I say about this photo? You know, this is a mama with uh, her puppies. I think there's maybe five or six puppies in the photo. And, you know, she's touching noses with one of them. Uh, it's very adorable. And, you know, I'm sure it's a lot of work to run a dog rescue, but I would think uh, moments like this make it all worthwhile, right? All right, very cute stuff. I do want to ask you a question. You know, I've I've covered a story about uh, dog rescues in the North, and this is a, a problem that comes out of these stories sometimes is there are issues arise in this industry because there it's an unregulated industry. Uh, some organizations have been uh, have been banned from entering First Nations communities because essentially they have taken dogs from families, thinking that these dogs are just free roaming and uh, sort of just essentially stealing dogs. Uh, tell us a little bit about what some of those issues are for, for this industry. Yeah, as you say, you know, um, these dog rescues aren't really regulated. Oftentimes they're charities that rely on donations and volunteers. You know, it's people 
really doing this out of, you know, the goodness of their hearts, but things can and do go wrong. And, you know, perhaps that's because they're unregulated. So there's little recourse when things do go astray. And as you say, you know, that's one example that I mentioned in my story um, that APTN had reported about a dog rescue in Ontario that's no longer welcome in a First Nation in Manitoba because when they went there, they took um, two family dogs. And the rescue says this was a mistake on their part. Um, and the family was able to get one of the dogs back, but the other dog had been adopted out and the family was trying really hard to get it back. And I don't know how that story ends, but, you know, it's got these kind of colonial overtones where often non-Indigenous people will go into Indigenous communities with this idea that they know better. And, you know, I think that that's something that Holly's cognizant of, you know, it's something that we had talked about. She really makes a point of cultivating relationships with the communities she works with. Um, you know, she doesn't go into community and just take a dog as either chief and counsel or someone, you know, telling them this dog is a stray, it can be adopted out. Um, and, you know, Fort Albany, they have a, a partnership with them and they seem happy with it. So that's really an important aspect of this work is building these relationships. Sure. Now, really important story, really cute photos as well. Thank you so much uh, for, Thank you. for joining us. Of course. Thanks. The agenda this week heard what a green farming revolution could do for Canada and the world and examined how to get Russia out of Ukraine. The agenda's week in review begins assessing who the economy does and doesn't work for. Have a look. Kaylee, let me try this with you. The, if you look at the unemployment numbers, you know, they're not bad, relatively speaking, if you look at the last 40, 50 years. We're, we're in a pretty good place right now. Do you think that gives Canadians a false sense of how strong the economy is and that they don't realize we're actually in more trouble, you know, per this report? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think that uh, we've seen the labor force shrink a little bit uh, compared to the rest of the economy. And we saw so many uh, retirements or accelerated number of retirements during the pandemic. So the unemployment rate has something to do with that as well. Um, and what we thought or what I thought we would see during that period of labor tightness is employers start to invest in technology that could work alongside workers to enhance productivity. That would also uh, mean that we would need to raise wages for workers who are working and developing, working alongside that technology, developing that te happened. technology. We didn't see that happen. Instead, we saw um, policies that would just put downward pressure on wages and working conditions, trying to sort of generate some sort of job creation, uh, and also then um, the Bank of Canada coming in and raising the interest rate so quickly to dry and dampen economic growth instead of actually taking um, the, the energy that was in the economy right now and sort of boosting us forward. Graham, can I get you on that? Do you think Canadians don't quite understand that our fundamentals really aren't as good as we'd like to think they are? Yeah, I think one of the things that people are coming to, to terms with now is that um, what was a demographic tailwind for maybe most of Canada's history, if not all of it, is now turning into a headwind. So, uh, you know, for, for most of our history, we've had a growing population, we've had a, a growing employment ratio, a certain amount of number of workers relative to the total population. Um, and now that's shifting fundamentally in a way that uh, the, 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 the dropping uh, unemployment rate, the low unemployment rate, is actually masking some big problems here. Um, mainly that you know we're our employment ratio is dropping and our productivity per worker is not increasing so the number of hours worked is no longer increasing and also the productivity per hour worked is not increasing which means that we're going to run into some big problems um, in terms of delivering services and actually having really productive economic activity and prosperity so Neil so everything Graham said is correct but I don't think the average Canadian thinks in terms of productivity and unemployment rates they're looking at my housing costs are going up my food costs are skyrocketing I make the same or less than my parents did 30 or 40 years ago doing the same kind of job. And I might be working two jobs or uh, in a precarious uh, kind of ca casual form of employment to make ends meet childcare costs. Maybe they're going to come down a little bit going forward. But I think the average person is looking at all of the cost uh, factors that are, are hitting them really hard in their pocketbook. Uh, they might have a job, but how secure is that job? So I, I think for the average person, uh, 
they don't feel confident. And you can look at those top line numbers like unemployment and uh, productivity and GDP growth, but those don't translate to the person who's living uh, as a single mom in uh, Toronto or uh, with a couple kids in, in Northern Ontario, and they're wondering, what's the future hold for me? And are things going to be better for my child than they are for me? Because we're starting to run into questions about whether or not that's the case going forward. In which case, let's say all of what we have discussed so far is sort of the prelim for the big question that we want to put on the table right now. And Brett, I'll get you to start on this one. And that is, who is the economy working for? Tackle that if you would. The economy is principally working for asset owners right now. We've seen since the 2008 financial crisis, the value of almost any good, um, whether it's real estate, art, uh, equities, or stock investments, go up substantially in an era where we are a wash in capital. And uh, by contrast, we haven't seen wages keep up with those asset uh, value increases. So really, the economy is working right now for people who own things. Um, it's not to say, though, that Ottawa hasn't tried very substantially to try to address this. We saw under a series of budgets, under former Finance Minister Morneau, cuts in corporate taxes, increases in subsidies to business uh, for research and development. We saw an acceleration in depreciation for tax deduction or tax deductions for capital spending. Uh, we are now the only G7 country with free trade agreements with every other G7 country and with every continent in the world. And so we have really gone to the policy toolbox to try to do all the things that business say, says that it needs in order to invest in improving the situation and the effectiveness of workers. But we haven't seen business come back with uh, the capital spending that that was supposed to incent. So the big question to me now is what more do we need to do? And I think that's a question for business as much as it is for policymakers. The next green revolution, that is a reference to what? Well, some, some of the viewers may remember the first green revolution in the 1950s and 60s when agriculture was transformed globally and we developed all sorts of technologies that allowed us to produce a lot more food and that has helped uh, feed the world, staved off uh, a lot of starvation in many parts of the world. We need an equal green revolution this time, but the green is on climate. Canadians probably don't appreciate that roughly 10% of our national emissions come from agriculture. When you factor in the whole supply chain, what it takes for fertilizer, what it takes from diesel to get that food to your door, it can run up to 20%. So if we're gonna get to net zero, we've got to address ag agricultural emissions. But there's a bonus to this as well because agriculture can be a carbon sink. We can absorb greenhouse gas emissions in the soil. And we have a soil base in this country that is almost unequaled in the world. And we've got to put that to work as a national asset and reward farmers as the land stewards for capturing that uh, carbon. That's going to be critical for us to get to net zero. Now, all of this was true two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. What has changed profoundly is what happened in the world last year with the Ukraine war, which in our view was not a one-off. We are going to continue to see geopolitical and geoeconomic disruptions uh, that will affect com commodities trades, that will affect the price of oil and gas, the price of food for many years to come. And that creates an additional imperative for Canada as a major exporter of food to the world to produce a lot more food, to produce it more sustainably, and to get it to the parts of the world that are not going to be able to rely on producers like Russia uh, as they might have in, uh, in years past. Okay, ton to unpack there, so let's start to do that. If the mission is to reduce that 10 or 20% to zero, how well are we doing at that mission so far? Uh, we're, like in a lot of sectors, kind of moving along very slowly, and we need to accelerate that if we're going to get those 100 or so megatons uh, out of our carbon footprint of 720 down to 50, down to zero. Now, fortunately, we have the technologies. We know what to do, uh, but we've got to, we've got to scale it. We have the technologies to capture more uh, carbon in the soil. We have the technologies to manage livestock better, and we can, we can get into methane emissions. But Canada can be a leader in this. So it's not just about producing more food with fewer emissions for the world. That's kind of job one here. There's also an opportunity to develop the technologies and create kind of a Silicon Valley 
of agriculture technology or ag tech as it's called in places like Guelph, in places like Calgary, and export these technologies as the rest of the world tries to figure out also how to produce more food with fewer emissions. As you look at the amount of food that we are producing today and, and the need for whatever amount that is, take us 30 years down the road, take us almost, the year 2050. What's the difference going to be between what we're doing today and what we'll need in 2050? We're not going to be producing radically different foods. We're not talking about Franken foods, for, for, <laughs> for instance. We'll still continue to produce a lot of canola, a lot of beef, uh, a lot of uh, dairy products. Uh, but we'll be producing them differently and selling them to different markets in the world. You don't even need to go 25 years out. We estimated RBC that Canada will need to export 25% more food by the year 2030. So that's a massive increase in exports. That's actually a benefit for, for all of Canada. I want to put another one of your five items to you from your Wall Street Journal piece of a month ago, and that is the war should not end with the dismemberment of the Russian Federation. And, um, well, let me read an excerpt here. This is from the Deputy Director of the International Centre for Defence and Security in Tallinn, Estonia, who's written a piece called Don't Be Afraid of a Russian Collapse. It is ironic that Western Europeans are more afraid of escalation than countries closer to Russia, even though the latter would be directly affected by any escalation of the war. Being the object of Russia's imperial policies from the 1700s to the present day has taught the Baltic countries and Poland to fear Russian strength more than weakness and to fear Russia's potential victory in Ukraine much more than its defeat. The Ukrainians' courage and determination to defend their independence is a historic chance for the United States and Europe to deliver a decisive blow to Russian imperialism and toxic nationalism. But so far, the major Western powers hesitate to throw their weight behind this outcome. Okay, tell us why you think a dismemberment of the Russian Federation is something we should not desire. Well, I'm old enough to remember the collapse of the Soviet Union and at that time, uh, uh, the American government was terrified of thousands of nuclear scientists, nuclear devices running around completely unconstrained. Uh, we did a lot of work, um, some of it wiser than others maybe, but in the end, we managed to contain that. But this, the, the actual dissolution of Russia, Let's think about the human cost in the Caucasus, in South, in 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 the part in Chechnya, uh, the wars that might break out between Azerbaijan and Armenia on a much larger scale. Let's think about where China would be, what China might do in that situation. Uh, it's a it's a catastrophe, and then we should also think there are a lot of you know there are millions of Russians who are not responsible in any way for what Putin has done, what happens to them in that situation? Does that actually enhance European security? I agree with the Estonians, the Poles, and the Ukrainians that a, that a strong Russia is a threat to them. That's why I believe in a strong NATO alliance, and I believe that the, that the war should end with Ukraine having ironclad security guarantees. But that... I don't think those, it's much harder to protect someone from chaos than from a power. And I, there is nothing to be gained in my mind from the collapse of civil authority and the outbreak of strife and war in Russia. Didn't, didn't, didn't make anybody happy in World War I. I don't think it would make anybody happy today. Let me get Vel Valina. Janice, I'll get to you in a yeah. second. Valina, where do you stand on, this, on the question of this being a unique historic opportunity to deliver a decisive blow to Russian imperialism? Indeed, it is a unique, uh, unique moment, and uh, in fact, uh, we are facing this kind of uh, bifurcation within Europe uh, between the Franco-German bloc, which is pushing for, as I said, the status quo, coming back to the status quo before the war began, which I think is unrealistic. And then, of course, uh, Central Eastern European countries, but also the Nordic countries. Uh, think about the fact that two neutral countries, the one being neutral for the last 250 years, the other for... Uh, 
you know, for more than 70 years and now joining NATO this year. Uh, this is also showing actually uh, how um, how unique the moment has become. I think that um, um, we all indeed uh, share the same interest on both sides of the Atlantic that, um, in fact, uh, a disem dismemberment of uh, the Russian Federation, dissolution of the Russian Federation, uh, weakening of uh, this uh, imperial uh, project, geopolitical project, is in our uh, common interest uh, for the reason that uh, neither the United States nor the European powers want to face a two-front scenario in the future, given the real challenge coming from uh, China. So this uh, modus vivendi of coordination that I was talking about just a year ago in your show, Steve, ahead of the beginning of the war, this is the real problem, the threat multiplier coming from Moscow and Beijing, while Beijing is realizing that it needs to protect its uh, border in the north. It needs to have security uh, that is guaranteed by Russia while facing uh, rising India and also military escalation with Taiwan. So obviously, uh, a weakened Russian isn't in the interest of the West. And I argue also that um, um, uh, the dissolution of uh, the Russian uh, Federation may present Russians and hopefully the new generation uh, within Russia with uh, new opportunities. We uh, should look at uh, uh, Russia as being under complete control of one specific clique of the KGB-like clique of people. This is not a uh, 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 a country that is being ruled by checks and balances the way how the West understands it. And this is not in our interest to have a KGB-like rule uh, country that operates uh, in our direct vicinity. So obviously, uh, we should go for this, uh, for sure. That's just some of what we've covered this week. You can find more, including the full conversations on our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's it for this Friday, January 13th, 2023. Artificial intelligence has come a long way quickly. Monday, Steve finds out whether AI chatbots could do to knowledge workers what robots did to manufacturing jobs. I'm Jane Jagannathan. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. Have a great weekend, and Steve, we'll see you on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pagan is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.